Assalamu alaikum. Okay, so what I had to do for this channel is create an email list. The reason why is because due to the nature of the content of this channel, I don't know when the content is going to just mysteriously disappear or this channel will be shut down. The email mail list is just for the followers or the subs so that you know where these things are just in case this mysteriously happens. So just go down to the link in the description of the video, click join email list, Put your email address in there, and boom, you're good to go. That means that I can also send you other information that I cannot post here on YouTube, and you'll also know where the channel is and where the content is in the event that it does disappear. Okay, let's cook. Okay, big up to a sub by the name of Sabrina Smith for this one, a sub on this channel. Sabrina Smith, thanks for this one here. And we're going to go over the Homer G. Phillips Hospital in St. Louis, okay? But in order to do so, we must talk about the brother, the man who is named after by the name of Homer G. Phillips, okay? So Homer G. Phillips, a black man, he grew up in Sedalia, Missouri. He's the son of a Methodist minister who had been a slave. Now, interestingly, Homer G. Phillips, he was one of 10 children. He was one of 10. So when Homer G. Phillips was young, his mother passed away, okay? She passed away when he was a young boy. And the death of his mother made him more independent and made him mature. I believe he spent some time in uh, some foster homes back and forth, things like that, uh, because he had lost his mother. I don't know everything, the ins and outs about his youth and what happened after his mother died, but I know it was rough and he did spend some time in some foster homes, okay? But he overcame. And Homer G. Phillips went to study law at Howard University in Washington, D.C. after high school, okay? So he went to study law at Howard University. Now, after he finished school at Howard University in D.C., he eventually went back to his home state and he relocated to St. Louis, okay? So now Homer G. Phillips is living in a St. Louis area. He's living his life. He marries a woman by the name of Ida Alexander, and she is an actress and an artist as well. So I think maybe people need to uh, look into her a little bit more, her life and her works. I don't know much about her. Uh, her name is Ida Pearl Alexandra, and Homer Phillips married her, okay? In the meantime, he's a married man, and he's establishing himself in St. Louis as a young lawyer, okay? So he's going about his life, he's doing his thing, he's a young lawyer, he's moving and shaking. He's, he notably represented victims of the 1917 East St. Louis race riots, okay? So he actually uh, represented these people and he did it pro bono, which means they did not have to pay him, being that they were his peoples, you know, he did it pro bono, he did it for free, okay? Now, Homer G. Phillips, he became a very prominent civil, light, civil rights person in the area, and he was also heavily involved in politics, okay? So he was a lawyer, he did his thing, and he was also involved in the civil rights of his people, and he was also involved in politics. Uh, he was very influential in the local Republican Party, and he also made a bid for Congress in the year of 1926, but he was unsuccessful, okay? But he kept on moving and shaking and doing things. He was the founder of the Citizens Liberty League, and what they did was they advocate for black people after the city of St. Louis decided that there was going to be segregation in housing. So they had a mandate in the year of 1916 in St. Louis that housing was going to be segregated, okay? So what he did is they, he was a founder of what he called the Citizens Liberty League. Now, this Liberty League was for the rights for the progression of black people. They also, this Liberty League that he, this thing that he started, they also worked to oppose various Jim Crow laws, the Ku Klux Klan, and mob violence in the form of lynching, okay? So this is an organization that he created to better the lives of his people and to protect his people from some of the terrorism and violence that our people were going through at the hands of these savages, okay? Now, this league that he created also work to remove job restrictions for black, you know, black people. There were a lot of job restrictions. No black people can work here. No, we don't, we don't hire black people. These are jobs in the public sector, the private sector, whatever. He, his, his organization 
was trying to knock down those barriers because, of course, in order for our people to live in America, we need jobs. This would improve the quality of life of the people. And one major thing that he was doing was he was trying to improve access to medical care for black people as well, okay? Now, when it comes to improving access to medical care, this is where this man, Homer G. Phillips, is primarily remembered, okay? With all the things that he did, he was a man, he was a freedom fighter for his people, you know? He took his, his career, his expertise, and what he was good at as a lawyer, and he did things to protect and, and create better lives for his people. But he's primarily, primarily remembered for the Homer G. Phillips Medical Center, okay, or the Homer G. Phillips Hospital, I'm sorry. Now, what he did, what Homer G. Phillips did was he fought hard to have this new hospital that would give adequate care to black people in St. Louis or the black population in St. Louis because it was growing pretty fast, you know. During that time, during that time that Homer G. Phillips is running around and moving and shaking as a lawyer, he's advocating for the rights of his people, doing things like that. He's trying to get medical care for his people. He's fighting against Jim Crow laws and the KKK and lynchings. So of course, quite naturally, he started to get more enemies. Not that these people weren't already his enemies, but it's like, okay, we don't like you even more. He basically, more white people started to zero in on who he was because any black man that stands for anything for his people, it upsets white people, okay? That's just the way it is. That's the way it always been. Today, Homer G. Phillips doing these type of works will be called a racist by his own people, unfortunately. But that was only that's only because so many of our people have been bamboozled by these white supremacists. OK, but anyway. Now, he was advocating for this hospital for black residents in St. Louis, and he wanted this hospital to be accessible for the residents, for his people, okay? And he, Homer G. Phillips felt that the best place to put this hospital was in a black neighborhood in St. Louis called The Ville, okay? Now, The Ville was a black neighborhood in St. Louis. It was a good place to live. It was a place where, you know, black doctors, lawyers, factory workers, housekeepers, they all lived alongside each other. Great place to live, okay? And it's a place where you could see black people doing things, being productive, from all walks of life, whether they were a lawyer, whether they were a housekeeper, this is a neighborhood where black people all live together. And the youth can be inspired by this because to see many black people doing things in many different professions is, all, is, a, is a good thing. So to see a child who may be the, uh, uh, somebody, a child who may be inspired, you know, by a doctor or a lawyer, and usually in those situations, a black child who wants to be a doctor or a lawyer, they can't walk outside and see a doctor or a lawyer, you know? But in this community, this is how it was. A black child who was inspired to, uh, you know, to be a doctor or a lawyer or something else, whatever they wanted to, wanted to be, they can go outside, they can walk down the street, and they could actually see that. It was a reality for them. And that was the good thing about this neighborhood called The Ville. Okay? Now, Homer G. Phillips, he knew that there was a need for black people to have their own adequate hospital. So this was his new mission. This is what he was going to do. Now, at the time, black residents, if they had to go to the hospital, if they needed medical care, they had to go to what was called hospital number two. And this was, this, this hospital that they had for black people called hospital number two, it was a former medical college in a place called Mill Creek Valley. And to get to this hospital, it took a long time. It took a long time to get there. This hospital only had 177 beds. It was far from where they live. So Homer G. Phillips knew we need our own hospital. We need better medical care. This is very important. OK, so he became very vocal and motivated about having a hospital in this black neighborhood for black residents so that we can get there. If we needed medical care, we need our own. The white folks got their own called hospital number one. So in the year of 1923, a mayor by the name of Henry Kill, he agreed to designate one million dollars of an eighty seven million dollar bond for a new hospital for the black residents. OK, so this mayor, Henry Kill must not have been such a evil, evil man, must have, must have had some, some good things in his heart to designate, you know, $1 million for black people to have their hospital. 
not giving them too much credit. This is what you're supposed to do when you have residents who need a hospital. But at this, at this time, you know, being a white man, most of the time, they would say, no, I'm not giving anything. They got hospital number two, that's all they need, that's all they get. But this man, Mayor Henry Kill, must have had some goodness in his heart where he said, okay, I'm going to designate $1 million for a hospital for the black residents. Okay, now a problem that they had when, you know, now they have, they have the money designated, but a problem that they also had was the neighborhood that this hospital was going to be in. Of course, the black people wanted this hospital in their neighborhood. The white doctors, they wanted this hospital next to their hospital, which was hospital number one. Okay, so this is the hospital that the white people had, hospital number one. So Homer G. Phillips, he persuaded the city officials to build this hospital at St. Ferdinand Avenue and Whittier Streets in the Ville neighborhood. So, boom, they got that going. It looks like the black residents in St. Louis will soon have their own hospital. He convinced them to build this. It's looking good. But not so fast. Not so fast. This is what happened. The hospital project was stalled. Why? Because this man, Mayor Henry Kill, who designated this money for this black hospital, he had a, su a, a successor. Basically, he was not in office anymore, okay? There's a new mayor, and this new mayor is a real bitter cracker by the name of Victor Miller, okay? He was known to be a real bitter white supremacist knuckle-dragon beast cracker. He hated the idea of spending a million dollars on a hospital for black people, you know? He was also caught up in a lot of scandal, and he was rumored to be a member of the KKK. Now, this man was so disgusting, right? This dude, Victor Miller, he was eventually forced to step away from his mayoral duties. And of course we know that was not due to his views that he had for black people. It's white people that got him up out of there. So when your own community is getting you up out of there, you know this guy had to be pretty disgusting, okay? So by the time that this dude was forced to step away though, check this out. He managed to delay this hospital project that Homer G. Phillips wanted to get done for a decade. So just imagine that. Just because he's in office, he was able to delay the progress of this hospital for over 10 years. For over 10 years. Unfortunately, y'all, this is what happened. The delay of this hospital may have been the reason why Homer G. Phillips never witnessed the groundbreaking of this hospital. He never witnessed, he never seen this Homer G. Phillips hospital that was named after him, okay? Why is that? Because at the time that Homer G. Phillips was moving and shaking, you know, again, he made a lot of people angry in the white community. You see what kind of man he is, some of the things that he did, you know, he was advocating for black people. You're gonna always have a lot of white enemies anytime you do this, you know? You advocate for a better, better quality of life for your people, you know, you're going to piss people off. And you never know who. People in high places. So, this is what happened. One morning on June 18th, the year 1931, Homer G. Phillips left his home at 1121 Albert Avenue near Fountain Park. If you're from St. Louis, get in the comments. You know where this is at. I don't, okay? So, after he left his home, he walked to Delmar Boulevard to catch a streetcar downtown. While he's waiting to catch a streetcar, he's leaning up against a windowsill, reading a newspaper. Two white dudes approached him. One of them punched Homer Phillips in the face, and then they both pulled out guns and shot him up. Age of 51, Homer G. Phillips died on the sidewalk. They took him up out of here, y'all. They took him out of here. Now, police suspected that the family of somebody by the name of George Fitzhugh did this because George Fitzhugh, Homer Phillips, was protecting George Fitzhugh's daughters for a, from a counterclaim. So basically, this family hired this man passed away named George Fitzhugh, and the family hired her, his daughter hired Homer G. Phillips to protect her from a counterclaim that she was getting. Now, what happened was the family objected to his fee. They didn't want to pay the fee, right? 
and he re he re he refused to release the settlement from escrow because they didn't pay the fee. Okay, these people hired him. They didn't pay the fee. Homer G. Phillips, he refused to release the settlement from escrow. And the family was mad. And the family has, had even made public threats against him. Okay? So eventually, the police arrested this white man who died, whose family that Homer G. Phillips was defending, who he had an agreement with, with they, uh, he, they, the police arrested their grandson by the name of George McFarlane. He's 18. And they arrested his friend named Augustus Brooks, who's 19. And, and they charged them with the murder of Homer G. Phillips. Okay? In the year 1932, these two white dudes had separate trials. They both were acquitted. One witness couldn't be found. And another one suffered a mental breakdown. This case to this day remains unsolved. Who did this to Homer G. Phillips? They know who did it. The police know who did it. The town of St. Louis knows who did it. You know, we know how this goes. We know how this goes. Uh, this man had many enemies. Who knows if these boys even did it? You know what I mean? They could have just been thrown out there. They probably did. They probably didn't. But when you have a man who's doing things to improve the quality of life of his people, you piss a lot of, of the people from the white community off. Who knows? But I know they know who did it. These people know who did it. To this day, the police department, I'm sure they know who did it. The mayor knows who did it. So anyway, that's what happened to Brother Homer G. Phillips. But guess what? Even taking him out of here did not stop all of his hard work and effort. So the mayor of St. Louis by this time was a man by the name of Bernard Dickman. And Bernard Dickman was a strong support, supporter of Homer G. Phillips, and he wanted to make sure that this project went on. He wanted to make sure it went on. This man's name is Bernard Dickman. And he also described the completion of this hospital as one of the happiest moments in his administration. So Bernard Dickman, I guess he wasn't no super duper cracker, you know? He wanted this to go on. He had a good, he had something good in his heart. He wanted this project to continue so that these black residents have their own hospital. So that's a good thing, right? Yes. So on February 22nd, 1937, the Homer G. Phillips Hospital was dedicated. This is when they built this hospital. This hospital was complete. Now the black residents in St. Louis have their own hospital. The white people got hospital number one. The black people had this new state of the art Homer G. Phillips Hospital. When they dedicated this hospital, they had parades, they had speeches, they had a crowd of over 4,000 people. They all gathered to uh, celebrate, they cheered for this grand opening. The final cost for this hospital was $3.16 million. This hospital consisted of a main central administration building with four radiant wings. It contained 685 patient beds and required 800 employees to keep it running. Along with the additional services, the building, it had a separate nurse's home, which, which it was a, they had a place basically which was dormitories for 147 nurses and 24 interns to live at, you know, a nurse's home, you know, uh, the Homer G. Phillips Hospital, it was a big deal. And it would instantly become the largest, best equipped, and most technically advanced hospital in the world committed solely to medical care of the city's black population. That's major. That's major. The largest, most equipped. This is strictly a hospital for black people, not some shack, you know, not some little thing that they try to throw us in before. Like I said, the little hospital, the other one that had only like a hundred something beds, you know, just sent them there. This is a state of the art, beautiful hospital. By the year of 1941, this hospital, hospital became the premier training ground for black medical professionals. By the year 1941, okay? Just seven years after it opened, this hospital was one of the, this hospital was the training ground to one third of the graduates from two black medical schools in the country, okay? So one third of the graduates of these schools were going to train and work at this hospital. Within 20 years, 
the hospital trained the largest number of black doctors and nurses in the world within 20 years. It had a fully accredited training pro program for black interns, residents, and nurses. It had a school for x-ray technicians, laboratory technicians, and medical record librarians. By the year 1945, the Homer G. Phillips Hospital was ranked in the top five largest general hospitals in the country. So we have this hospital that's only for black people, and it's one of the top five in the country, general hospitals in the country. The hospital was doing good, it was, it, was, it, was, it was thriving, it was doing great, but it was faced with some problems. Now, this hospital did suffer from a reputation of being consistently underfunded and understaffed. So employees often complain of long pay, low pay, long hours. However, the hospital always remained an enormous source of pride for the community. So I guess when you have something like this, it's going to be some issues. Employees want more money. Everybody wants more money. They're working all these hours. But in order to get these things done, especially when it's a black hospital, I guess people have to dig deeper and feel something deeper in them to get this done you know, because not only was that an obstacle, you could just imagine the other obstacles that they had to deal with, deal with just because it was a, a black hospital. So there's always going to be other entities and movements who are constantly at work to try to destroy anything that's black. So we can't forget about that also. OK, so by the year of 1955 in St. Louis, the practice of seg segregation came to an end at the city hospitals. There's no more segregation in city hospitals, and the mayor demanded that the Homer G. Phillips Hospital should be a place that treated all patients based on where they lived in the city as opposed to the color of their skin. Now we know, as we know people, integration destroyed everything that black people worked for at one point. So they're gonna integrate this hospital now. Basically, it's not gonna be a hospital for black people only anymore, it's gonna be a hospital for residents of the city based off of where you live. Integration destroyed everything that black people ever had. You know, it's, it's, it's impossible. And we know this from history. It's impossible for black people to have success when white people play an important role in logistics or management or anything like that. Anything where they're making decisions and playing an important role, it's impossible for black people to have success. It's never going to happen. Never did. Never will. That's just human nature, you know what I'm saying? But they expect us, you know, to put up with this. Anyway, many people do believe that the desegregation of this hospital eventually led to the closing of the Homer G. Phillips Hospital. Sadly, you know, this step forward for humanity may have likely initiated the hospital's eventual, eventual closing, y'all, like we said. This is supposed to be a step forward for humanity. Oh, everybody could come here. Yeah, it's closing down now. You know, and there were also other issues such as, you know, population decline, less tax money. OK, so we have less, less money, less taxpayers living in this area or things like that. Money that can go to this hospital. And you got to figure when there and this is something called that, well, it was at one point a black hospital, you know they get they were already getting less money than everybody else. That's just American white community nature, you know? But even through all that, this was still one of the best hospitals in the country, you know? So what eventually happened was the city of St. Louis decided to consolidate their medical services. In the late 1960s, what they did was the psychiatric and neurological departments at the Homer G. Phillips Hospital moved to the City Hospital One, which was primarily the white hospital. So for the next 15 years, right, supporters of the two city hospitals debated which one should remain open. So they're going at it. No, Homer G. Phillips should stay open. No, Hospital One should stay open. You know what this was. This was just a battle. We want the white hospital here. No, we want the black hospital. They went on and on. Now, look at what they did. The city hired two independent auditors, okay? So independent auditors, auditors came from some whatever, some company, basically to look at the whole situation and the totality of the circumstance as far as the hospital is concerned. These people are non-biased. 
And what they came up with was they believed that hospital number one, which is the white hospital, it should close. And Homer G. Phillips should stay open. These are people from their community telling them this. But the white community was not going for that. They did not agree. No, we don't want this hospital to stay open. We want this hospital, okay? Now, another thing that they ran into, another problem was that Washington University and the St. Louis University, they stopped making their staff available to Homer G. Phillips Hospital, okay? So it sounded like, sound like they kind of forming some Voltron, right? So these are the two major medical schools in St. Louis, okay? And what they did was they often sent their graduates to work at these hospitals. They stopped sending them to Homer G. Phillips, okay? So they said that the white hospital or hospital number one was more convenient and offered better salaries that, was more, that were more competitive. So they started to send all their people there. That's, that's like, that's, that's, that's Voltron. They forming Voltron. You know what they doing. You know, now, when they talked about the possibilities of closing Homer G. Phillips down completely, they, the people didn't back down easy. There were dozens of big public protests fighting to keep this hospital open. They fought. They tried to. The city wasn't going for it. The white community wasn't going for it. And the closing of this Homer G. Phillips hospital, it became a reality. On August 17th, 1979, the city ordered all patients and departments from Homer G. Phillips Hospital to be transferred to City Hospital Number 1. Homer G. Phillips Hospital eventually closed entirely, completely shut down by the year of 1985. It's done. It's a wrap. But this Homer G. Phillips Hospital and its significance remains an important chapter in St. Louis history and black history and our history. And it was just something, it just, it just shows you what we can do, you know, if we do the whole separate but not equal thing, because it's never going to be equal. Just give us, give us something, let us get our own thing popping, and look what we did, you know. Give us something, let us get our, okay, y'all don't want us there. Okay, that's cool. We, we don't want to go there either with y'all. Give us what we're supposed to get. Right. Let us get our own thing popping and we'll be good. And look what this turned out to be one of the best hospitals in the country. So in the year of 1980, the St. Louis Board of Aldermen decided to make this hospital a landmark. OK, in the year of 1982, the Department of the Interior added it to the National Register of Historic Places. This hospital this Homer G. Phillips Hospital. Now, in 2003, what they did was the Homer G. Phillips Hospital had a multi-million dollar renovation, and now it is used as a senior living facility. So it's good that they didn't knock it down, right? They use it as a senior living facility, and that's what's going on with it. That's what it is now. It's still there. They renovated it. So what could we say? Big up to this brother, Homer G. Phillips, for all the work that he did for his people. Big up to the people who worked with this hospital, this hospital moving and thriving, and who worked with pride knowing that this was a black hospital and it was something that was created for our people. Big up to them all. All right, y'all. Easy.